Um, well, let me very quickly add my welcome to Louise's, especially if you're here as a guest or for the first time, if you're friends or families of family of Johnny and Sarah's and Daniel's. Uh, it's great to have you. You're so welcome. And if you're watching online, I wanted to say again how much you're missed, and we hope that you are safe and well. Um, if you've got a Bible um, and you'd like to open it up to the book of Colossians, Johnny is going to come and read for us uh, from Colossians 1, verses 15 to 22. So maybe you've got a Bible, you brought a Bible with you, or you've got a Bible on your phone, um, Johnny's going to come and read for us. So let's, um, Johnny, over to you. Sorry, I didn't turn it on. Oh, no, it should be on. There you go. Perfect. Great. So Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Christ is the visible image of the in invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is su supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself, and he made peace, on, peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Let's just allow ourselves a moment to pray. Lord, thank you for um, the gift of being together. Um, thank you for family. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. Thank you for the different ways that you speak. Thank you for all that you have in store for us. And we ask that, Lord, that you speak to us. Speak to us through these words. Not just today, but um, over the coming weeks as we unpack it and dig deep into it together. We give you the rest of our time together. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you lead us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, the person we've just been reading about. Amen. Well, I'm really looking forward um, to uh, be able to share with you the preparation that I've been doing over the last uh, month or so. Uh, around this new teaching series called, which I've called Advent and the Christ Hymn. I'll explain a little bit more about uh, the title as I go. But my job today, really, uh, my goal, my main goal is to do some setup, to do some introduction. And um, I want to, I wanna, I suppose, briefly share some ideas uh, that I've been digging out for us as a family around what this text is, how it came to be, who wrote it, uh, why it was written, and with that, I think even more importantly, to link it to where we are now, and by that I mean what it actually has to say about the, um, the beating heart of what Advent is all about. Um, as uh, you've heard from Louise and Taylor, um, we're going to be covering all of this stuff today, doing the intro, doing the setup, and then pressing pause and then we've got our Christingle the week after that, and then on the 5th and the, and the 12th of December, we're going to be picking back up and digging a little bit deeper into the text that Johnny just read for us. But before we get there, before we can kind of dip our toes into Colossians chapter 1, um, I want to start with a bit of a pastoral uh, steer. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to tell us about um, uh, this great Advent resource that I hope that you got a copy of on your uh, seat. If you didn't get one, uh, you can uh, get one to download. Uh, if you go to the website, top left corner, hit on the Advent tab, and then right down at the bottom of that page, you can download a, a PDF version of this. 
And I suppose the first thing I wanted to say is that it's not just a reading plan, okay? Although it is. If you look at page four forward, uh, you'll see that there is, um, featured in there on, on page four, is a, a series of readings starting next Sunday, uh, the, the first Sunday in Advent, Advent Sunday, uh, through to uh, Christmas Day, the 25th of December. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you uh, to, to, to take that home, put it on your fridge, put it in the middle of your Bible, put it on your bedside locker, whatever's going to prompt you to see that and to use it. But the, at the back of the booklet, if you've got that open in front of you or um, downloading from the website, we put together, I want to, sh I want to encourage you to look at them, uh, some prayer resources that we've kind of curated and brought together to there for personal, some of them are for personal use, some of them you'll be able to use if you're going to buy an advent pack or if you're going to come and make one at Create for Christmas, you could be able to use those at dinner time with family uh, or maybe when friends come over to have dinner, if we're still allowed to do that in two or three weeks time, uh, you might want to be able to use some of these prayers and some of the liturgy that we've pulled together for times like that where you can meet together, meet God together as family and friends. But I suppose that all brings us to the question of why? Why bother with Advent at all? What's the point? Maybe uh, you're sitting there thinking that uh, exact thing right now. Maybe you're new to church or to faith, full stop. Or maybe you're new to uh, a church like St. Catherine's that has its roots in a more traditional denomination. And you've never really been asked or encouraged to explore uh, something like Advent. So either way, it's a really important question. It's a helpful question. Why Advent? Why bother with Advent at all? And I suppose I just want to start my talk today by spending a little bit of time trying to answer that question uh, before moving on uh, our attention, turning our attention to Colossians chapter 1. And I suppose our reason, the reason behind pooling uh, resources like that together isn't just to get us reading our Bibles or isn't just getting us to pray every day, as hugely valuable as that is. After all, the church that prays together stays together. But I suppose the reason behind it all, I suppose, is that there's something else going on as well. Another part of the reason we mark moments like this throughout the year is because they root us back into something that we need. They root us back into something that we can't do without. They root us back into something that is bigger than ourselves. Advent is one of those moments in the church calendar year that is like a, a moment of reconnection, a moment of reconnection. Uh, next Sunday, it doesn't just mark the beginning of Advent, four Sundays in the run-up to Christmas, uh, Christmas Day. Next Sunday is actually the beginning of the new calendar year for the church. Maybe you already knew that. Uh, maybe you didn't. But the calendar year every year starts afresh with Advent. The church calendar year, it starts afresh every year with the story of Jesus at the center. The early Christians, as they developed the church year, um, they, they, they developed the, the church's year as a way of telling, of learning, and reliving the story of Jesus. That sits right at the heart of our faith. It's, it's not whatever our experience has been. Maybe it's been positive, maybe it's been negative, but it, ultimately it's not uh, uh, about religiously going around and around the same sequence of events and never really getting anywhere. It's a little bit like we set reminders on our phones so that we don't forget what time of the day it is or where we need to be, or at least I need to do those kinds of things. Moments like Advent, like Christmas, like Epiphany, like Lent, like Holy Week, like Good Friday and Easter Sunday and Pentecost, they all act as guides that offer us, the church, the people of God, something of a course correction, jolting us back toward the path of formation and remembrance. Advent, if you're asking what it's all about, let me tell you, it's a time where, it's a time of remembrance. It's a time where we remember who we are. It's a, it's a time where we remember in the calendar year whose we are. And it's a time in the church calendar where we think again afresh what it means to be the people of God, what it means to be the people of God in the world. What is it that he calls us to be, invites us to be and do as God's people in the world? 
Advent is it's, it's simply a, it's a Latin word that when we translate it means arrival or coming. It's a moment in the church calendar year where we remember and celebrate the beating heart of the Christian message that in Jesus, God came in the flesh. The beating heart of the Christian message that tells us that in Jesus, God came in the flesh. That's good news. In Jesus, God came in the flesh. One of the very early church fathers, someone called Saint Saint Athanasius put it like this. The pre-existent Son of God became what we are so that he might make us what he is. The pre-existent Son of God became what we are so that he might make us what he is, which is what? Human beings in right relationship with God. That's great news. That's what lies at the beating heart of Christmas. During Advent, we don't just celebrate Jesus' first coming as we relive and tell the stories of angelic visitations, supernatural conception, stars moving around and shifting in the skies, wise men wandering with gifts to give and shepherds out in the fields. But knowing the rest of the story of Jesus' life, his ministry, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection, we remember during Advent and rely on his promise that he will come again and finish everything he has started. That is good news. Jesus is gonna come again. Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, he's gonna banish death. He's gonna end disease and suffering. He's going to end abuse and injustice, human trafficking, poverty, addiction, and oppression with his light and life. Both of these core beliefs that Jesus came as a baby and he will come again to finish what he starts. Those two core beliefs are central and living parts of the Christian hope. And that is why we need Advent to remind ourselves of these things to learn them again, to tell them to our children and our young people, and to commit to living them out in community in the power of the Spirit. I think Dublin really needs to hear that. In Advent, it's not just a season for comforting childhood stories. It's actually a, a season of deep sharpening for the church, an uncomfortable season at times as we dare to own for ourselves where we have drifted from or turned our backs on what many theologians call the scandal of particularity. What do I mean by that phrase? It's a phrase used in theological circles to discuss, to to begin discussing the apparent offensiveness of God being revealed in one person, in Jesus. God revealed in one person, Jesus. People aren't offended by the comforting and nostalgic Christmas card front stories of the baby Jesus per se, with the stable and the wise men and the angelic choirs and shepherds, or even of the idea of supernatural conception and a virgin birth. But when people hear the exclusivity of Jesus' claim that no one comes to the Father except through him, that's when people start to get antsy. Oh, can we really still talk like that in 2021? Shouldn't the church maybe think about moving on a bit more from that level of exclusivity? Can we say, can't we just say that the divine is everywhere? And that essentially it's the universe that loves us. Even within the church over the last five or ten years, I've heard this more and more and more. All kinds of competing ideas and alternative truths. People will say to me, Owen, I love the idea 
that we celebrate at Christmas that salvation is for everyone. What I'm struggling with is that you're telling me that salvation only comes from one person. You can ask any other world religion. They've got wisdom, deep wisdom, and prophets. They've got truths that we can live by. But it wasn't Muhammad in the, mon- in the manger. It wasn't Buddha in the manger. It was Jesus, the Son of God, love enfleshed, hope embodied, come to make us what he is. Or as Charles Wesley put it, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. It's Jesus. No one else can make that kind of a claim. That's the gospel. He loves us so much that he sent Jesus to bring the kind of freedom that we need, healing and wholeness. That's who he is. If you're here today and you're asking questions about who God is or what God is like, it's Jesus. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus is going to finish what he started. Thank God. Thank God, Jesus is going to finish what he has started. Thank God. I need need that hope. I don't know about you, but I need that hope. I need to rely on it more. I need to live on it more. Which brings us to the, the, the book of Colossians. I'll calm down a bit now. Sorry, I lost the run of myself. Colossians as a whole is a letter written by somebody called Paul, the Apostle Paul, one of the leaders in the early church. And, and some people believe, if you've read this book before, and I'd love it if you consider reading it again, um, or for the first time even, as we kind of track through the next three weeks, four weeks. And some people believe that it was the first prison letter he wrote, as in he wrote it while he was incarcerated for his faith, to a group of Christians living in a place called Colossae. Maybe you're familiar with that place. One of the things that's interesting in terms of just the other letters that he uh, uh, has written is that Colossians, the book of Colossians, he, 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 Paul never went to Colossae. And, 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 but he wrote to them none, nonetheless. He, he, never, he, he never traveled there. It was a church that he didn't plant or uh, start. And at the time of Paul's life, Colossae was a real melting pot kind of, of a place where all kinds of diverse cultural and religious practices and ideas were meeting together. And while we don't know lots of details about how the letter came to be, what we can tell from the way that it's written is that somehow this cultural melting pot moment had started to impact on the church there in some way. Bringing into question, teaching that undermined and brought into question whether Jesus really was who he said he was. Does that sound familiar? And what's interesting, I'd like you to look at it. I've put it, pulled it together. Just, I'm not sure if it'll work with the colors in the projector. This one seems to be clearer than this one today. But just look at the phrases that I've highlighted in different colors. Many believe that this is really, it's one of the earliest Christian statements of faith that we actually have. And, interestingly, as I've dug dug into this over the last month or so, I've learned it, many believe that it predates Paul himself. Actually, that what we have here, what these these words, they, they didn't start with Paul. Many believe that the Christ hymn, this section of text that we are looking at over the next number of weeks, that it was a familiar creed type song 
affirmation of faith or prayer that Paul took, made his own, and reformatted to encourage and warn a group of believers that were being confronted by false teaching about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. There's all kinds of theories about what was going on in Colossae, but where the biblical commentators seem to all agree is that what led Paul to write these words was the seductive allure of the counterfeit. The seductive allure of the counterfeit. A counterfeit, if you think about it in art, for example, it's, it's something that has been made in the exact image or imitation of something that has value with the intention of deceiving or defrauding people. Something that seems harmless at first, a shift in our thinking, a more inclusive or culturally palatable picture of who Jesus is and what it means to be his people in the world, that ultimately, over time, incrementally, however small or however subtle, ends up leading us out into a place we ought not to be. We'll get to explore that idea a little bit more over the next two or three weeks. But as we close out today, And I I just wanted to invite you to think about, sit there and think for a moment how you might like to mark Advent in some kind of a way this year with us. How could you use these next four weeks to sit inside of this story again? The story of how God's rescue operation for humans and the world alike has begun, but not yet become, is not yet completed. How could you find space and time and adopt some practices that will help you foster this attitude of celebration and remembrance in your lives? Maybe it's fasting from social media, again or for the first time. Maybe it's spending less time on our phones and in, or, or in front of the TV. Maybe what will help you is to use the resource that we have created for you and read these texts and use these prayers as individuals or as families. Maybe it's about getting up early in the morning and going out for a walk where you have that kind of centering, that, that way of starting the day out in nature, moving your body and making time for prayer. Maybe it's about doing something completely different and just committing to sitting in total silence for 10 to 20 minutes at the beginning or the end of every day, using the prayer of examine, for example, or something that you can use to top and tell your day, just to sit in God's presence in total silence and ask that he would reveal himself to you. We find ourselves facing huge uncertainty again. And these words of Paul's from from, from Colossians 1 seem as relevant today as they ever have been. This is not a time for church as entertainment, as personal preferences or taste, but I would, would like to suggest This is a time for stubborn loyalty to Jesus. A time for being unashamedly attached to the rock that never changes. A time for turning everything over to Jesus again, who is alone, the one who knows what each day holds and promises to be with us whatever we face. Let's stand and pray together. I'm going to ask us to pray with these words. I I didn't want to assume that you would. I I, I wanted to put them up um, and just ask if you'd be comfortable to pray them with me in a moment. Take a minute to read over them. Are Are they words that you feel you can own and pray with honesty today? And if we can, just set aside the, the, all the 
lovely sounds of life in the space. And if you're comfortable, just to close your eyes and just to spend just a moment asking that God would highlight to us what he's calling us to do in response to this word, how we might mark Advent as a church, as families, as individuals. Just allow yourself a moment to be still and to pay attention to God's presence here with us. Holy Spirit, we just say you're so welcome. Move among us. Bring your refreshing and your renewal. Fill us again, we pray. Maybe that's a, a new prayer to you, or maybe you'd be willing to pray it even now. It's one of the oldest prayers of the church. Come, Holy Spirit. Maybe you're even happy just to pray it with me now, these words. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh. Speak to us now. Reveal Jesus to us, Lord. We just recognize our desperate need of you, Holy Spirit. Empower us to live in the way Jesus did. Speak to us even now. We, we want to make room for you in our hearts this Christmas. Have your way, Lord. Jesus, we remember and celebrate you today. Your first coming. And we rely on your promise that you will come again to finish everything that you've started. We want to be part of that, Lord. So if you're happy to pray these words with me, I'd like to invite you to, to pray them. Oh Christ Jesus, when all is darkness and we feel our weakness and helplessness, give us the sense of your presence, your love and your strength. Help us to have perfect trust in your protecting love and strengthening power so that nothing might frighten or worry us. For living close to you, we shall see your hand, your purpose, and your will through all things. Amen.